CDKL5 is, refers to a protein called cyclin-dependent kinase-like 5. And when we ask what is CDKL5, we're thinking in terms of what are the diseases associated when this protein doesn't work the way that it's supposed to. And in CDKL5 deficiency disorder, that's what we're talking about. And this is a genetic disorder. And a lot of people say, well, what do you mean by a genetic disorder? I don't have anybody else in my family that has this. How did this happen? And as a genetic disorder, we have to explain to families that it's nothing that they did do or that they didn't do. This is just something that happens around the time when the egg and sperm come together. It's like having to make a telephone book. I know we don't know what telephone books are anymore, but having to make uh, hundreds of millions of copies of a telephone book without making any mistakes. And so that's what happens. Around the time egg and sperm comes together, a little spelling mistake happens. And it happens in the instructions that, tell, that the body uses to say how to make the CDKL5 protein. When you don't have that protein working, then you have CDKL5 deficiency disorder, or CDD as we call it. So it's diagnosed because your physician has a suspicion that you have a genetic disorder like CDD. We think that any patient who has early life epilepsy should have a genetic panel that tests for all of the different types of genetic epilepsies. And CDD is just one of a couple hundred of different causes of genetic early life epilepsies. So we think that the suspicion should happen very early on for babies who have seizures and it should happen through genetic testing. Well usually that first challenge uh, that patients face is the one that leads to diagnosis which is that they have very early life seizures. Some babies start having seizures as early as two weeks of age and even some mothers think you know I think maybe even my baby was having seizures in the womb. And so just to confirm what I mean by seizures, these are th things that also people call convulsions or fits. This is due to uncontrollable brain activity that can look different in babies than it sometimes might look in older adults. And so anytime a baby has an unusual movement, it's something that should be talked to with their uh, pediatrician or family doctor so that uh, early diagnosis can happen. That's the main concern that families often present with to their, their family doctor. It's with epilepsy. Oftentimes this epilepsy is difficult to control with medicines and so usually referral to a pediatric neurologist or even a specialist who specializes in epilepsy is necessary. But that's just one of the many challenges that patients have. The next one is there are a lot of challenges with regards to development. A lot of our patients have difficulty obtaining using their hands, uh, walking, sitting. And then one of the biggest um, issues that a lot of families have with their children is how can they communicate with them so they don't uh, have the ability to speak. But also a lot of our patients, importantly, have impairments with how they, they obtain their visual information. And so it's important to have a diagnosis of visual impairment so that those additional specialists are also brought on board. So the families are having specialists with regards to vision, speech, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Our patients also have a lot of issues with uh, gastrointestinal disturbances which include reflux and constipation. Other issues that our patients can have are with bone growth, and curvature of the spine, cold hands and feet. So there's a lot of issues that our patients have to struggle with and so it usually requires a team of specialists that are familiar with the disorder and if they're not familiar with the disorder they're willing to become familiar with the disorder so that they can provide the best care for our patients. So at the moment we don't have any specific treatments for CDD, but our goal is to have treatments that are specific to CDD, both that directly manage some of the symptoms better, because as I said, a lot of times the epilepsy does not respond to medicine, 
And that means that despite one, two, three, trying four and five different medicines, the patient will still have, in our case, daily seizures. And so we want better medicines that manage seizures, but we also want medicines that are going to treat the specific features of CDD, such as the intellectual disability, the inability to walk, talk, the inability to process visual information. We need medicines that target all of these things. So, but at the moment, there isn't anything specific. Uh, we call them patient advocacy groups. Uh, they're very important to families. It's important that families are referred to them early on. We think that at the time of diagnosis, the person making the diagnosis, whether that's a geneticist or a pediatrician or pediatric neurologist, it's very important that they connect the families at that point of diagnosis with the patient advisory groups. Because the patient advisory groups are providing the families with support both emotional but also intellectual support about things that they can expect. Uh, we think that the patient advisory groups are going to be a central point for literature also for physicians that are taking care of patients where they can see what are the latest papers, where, what are the latest clinical trials, where are they. We also want them to be a source so that a provider could say, oh, well I want to participate in that clinical trial. I want to I want to know more about CDKL5. I want to learn how to be an expert in it. So the patient advisory groups are going to have websites that are going to be useful both to the family but also to the clinicians involved. <music>